What I'd like to do in about the next 20 minutes is give you an overview of two things relative to Afghanistan. And the first is, what is the nature of the war? And the second is, what is the strategy? And why do I call it the wrong war? The nature of the war I base on, I have about 10 years now on battlefields uh, in Vietnam, Iraq, and Afghanistan. And as Barbara said, generals are okay, and secretaries of defense and presidents may have roles, but they better keep their egos under control because Tolstoy in his book War and Peace really had it right. What actually happens in war has much more to do with the tenacity of those who are fighting than it does with the pronouncements from on high, and I'll try to show you why. I'd like to just bring you through very quickly what the war looks like and the, how the strategy is embedded in it, and then turn it open for questions. Most of my time in Afghanistan, I've been there. I'm just about to go back for my 10th trip, so I probably have about 18 months altogether, 10 trips over the last four years. And I spend them all with the pl different platoons, Army platoons, Marine platoons, Special Forces outfits, and associated Afghan units. And I generally have been up where the first X is in the mountains. That's the Hindu Kush area at the top of Afghanistan, a wonderful place called Nuristan, um, and, but unfortunately we've been pushed out of there, and the Konar where you're looking at mountains, as I'll show you, that are 10,000 feet high. This is your classic Afghanistan. The other half of my time I spend down in the south where the other X is. This is where Mullah Omar and the Taliban began their attacks. And this is entirely different. This is uh, an alluvial plain that, that is extraordinarily similar in, in, in the terrain to Vietnam. Now. 90% of the fighting takes place between those two X's along the Pakistani border. The rest of Afghanistan is not as well involved because this issue is an issue of the Pashtuns. The Pashtun tribe, which is along the border and also on the Pakistani side, accounts for about 90% of the Taliban and 90% of the insurgency. The issue in the north is shown by this particular picture. This is the famous Corngal Valley that um, the movie Restrepo, uh, my friend Sebastian Younger did the, and Tim Hetherington did the movie, and I certainly hope it's going to win the Oscar. Although I was just with them in New York City last week and I was teasing them. They were on their way out to be with all the stars, but I was going to be with you here at Pros and Pole. But any of you looking at this, it wouldn't take you too long if I said to you, now, why don't we just take a drive down that road into the, into the Corngal Valley? And, and oh, by the way, uh, all the tribes are unfriendly, and they're up on the hillsides. And you would all immediately say to me, Bing, that's not your smartest idea. We did that. And for four years, we attempted to get the Corngal Valley under control, and we couldn't because we cannot close with the enemy in the mountains. All of our troops are wearing 80 pounds of armor. The enemy is not wearing any armor, and so there's no way you can ever catch him up in those mountains. So as a result, when you think of the war in the north, it's a long-distance war. For instance, we were being shot at when I took this picture from where the smoke is on the other side, and it looks like that's only 600 meters away. But you'd have to go down 2,000 feet and then up 2,000 feet on the other side to get there. And if you really were in good shape, you could get there in about seven hours. So it's, it's a lot of long-distance shooting that can go on forever. Because this is the famous uh, Durand line. I took this picture. And you notice that, that there is this particular fort right here. Well, that was a Taliban fort, and they were moving up every night to the border because that's Pakistan. And then they were coming over and taking mules and bringing their ammunition down and shooting at this colonel and his battalion. So the colonel said to me one day, he said, hey, Bing, he said, we'll go up along the, on the border. He said, with any luck, he said, one of those dumb son of a bitches will shoot at us. And if he does, then I can shoot back because it's self-defense. So we stood there, and he looked at them, and all they did was wave back to us. This is a vast sanctuary called Pakistan and extends for 1,500 miles. And you notice, notice the road. 
They drove every night up that road and then unloaded their, their ammo and came across the border. So the other problem you have in dealing with, Pakistan, with, with Afghanistan is called Pakistan. 1,500 miles. I mean, that extends from here to Miami. Now let's understand the essence of what we're doing. We went in in 2001 because the Taliban had supported al-Qaeda who had killed 3,000 Americans at the World Trade Center. So we went in to get those son of a guns. But what happened? In my judgment, several things happened. President Bush, God bless him, uh, had this religious belief in liberty for people. And I think he, he confused that with his role of president. And he took that and extracted it and said, we should give liberty also to the Iraqis and to the Afghans, which is a noble idea. But if you're a president, sometimes you have to be pretty hard-headed about how you put an idea into action. And we weren't able quite to do it. So when they looked around to say, well, who's, going to, who's really going to do this idea? They said, well, we have this thing called the United States military. So what happened was we, we, we took counterinsurgency. And that's a subject I know an awful lot about uh, because I fought it really hard for many, many months. But we, we perverted it and we turned it into nation building that was based on a social contract. And that social contract was that the United States of America would give to the people money and as much security as we could. And money we give about $14 billion a year. And in return, we expected them to turn against the Taliban. And all we really wanted them to do more than anything else was just tell us who among them was the Taliban. Because since everyone is wearing civilian clothes and we don't speak posture, we have no idea who among you is about to shoot me. But if you help me and point out who the mafia is among you, I'll take care of the mafia for you. That was the deal. That was the social contract that underlay everything we've been doing for 10 years. And I'll show you what happened. You had something called tribal loyalty. Look at this picture. This is a place called Ganji Gal that was 500 meters outside a battalion, United States battalion base, and for four years, the battalions that rotated through that base tried to say to the people in Ganji Gal, what do you want, we'll help you, and occasionally you get sniper shots. They were never able to really persuade the people. So about a year and a half ago, they said, well, the, the American battalion commander who was really kind-spirited said, I'll come in and help you with your mosque. And as we were driving in, look at this. Here are the kids, and those kids are about 12, 13 years of age. They were coming out on the road as fast as we were going in and putting, look at the size of those rocks. I mean, these are tough little kids. I thought, uh-oh. And it ended up in a big ambush that the tribe had set. <clears throat> and as and during the ambush, Eight Afghan soldiers were killed, four Americans were trapped and killed, and I hope this young man, and he's as rough as he looks, uh, Corporal Dakota Meyer, I hope, we've been pushing very hard, that he should get the Medal of Honor for what he did, because when everybody fell apart in the village, it was Corporal Meyer, God bless him, who, who came to the fore, and when his commander choked uh, and didn't know what to do because you're under fire from every place, Corporal Meyer took over the entire battle as a corporal, 21-year-old, and extricated the other Americans, and he killed 16 of, of the Taliban. But what really got to me more than anything else was the treachery that was unexplainable, just unexplainable, came out of nowhere. And I, I, I walked away from that and said, what do we know about postumes? What do they know about Americans? For four years we've been here trying to be nice, and when they got the chance, they turned just like that. We went into a town, I won't give the name of the town, but we're in the town and notice the person with the blue arrow ahead of him. For reasons that I won't get into, the, the, I'm just a journalist, but sometimes when you're out there with them, you, you can't help but to know the sources and methods and it'd be unfair of me to reveal any of them. But 
the company commander knew that that was the man that he wanted out of this group. So what he did was he just randomly plucked people as though it was a random search.